Thanks for the call. Thank you. No problem. Is there another question on the call this morning? Yes, Dr. Umar. Okay, let me take the brother. Go ahead, good brother. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Yes, sir. just down here in uh, September. Yes, Kentucky uh, State. Didn't get a chance to see you, but I tried. It was awesome. Thank Please you. Come to the city, man. Thank you, my brother. Go we right appreciate ahead. appreciate it, and I, I respect you so much. Appreciate that. So I'm going to get to my question here. I'm going to get to my question here. It's, it's kind of a deep question. But what role did Martin Luther King have in breaking down the black-owned businesses, the black, uh, you know, just the whole black concept? He came in and he wanted to integrate everything and make everything black and white. But now it seems like everybody wants to go to the black owned back to the black owned business. So what role did he play and was he playing it? Okay, uh first let I'm gonna answer the question, but I wanna clarify that this Tuesday morning call is about children. It's about answering education and mental health questions for our children. Um I'm gonna answer this question because you may not have known that, but for everyone else we Tuesday morning is about the children. So we want to keep the questions on our babies. Uh, they often get overlooked. They don't get enough attention as it is. So I want to keep Tuesday morning about the children. Um, and, and, and that's no offense to you, my brother, because you may not have known that this is only about helping parents help their children. But let me answer that question. The answer to that question for me is that the good doctor, Martin Luther King Jr., played no role in the destruction of black financial independence. Dr. King was assassinated on April the 4th, 1968. Integration had not come. So if he was gone before integration had came, he could not be responsible for integration. The civil rights bill, all it did was eliminate desegregation in publicly funded institutions and accommodations. That's it. There has never been a law in America, ever, ever, that forced black people to give up their hospitals. There has never been a law to force black people to give up their schools. There has never been a law to force black people to give up their business. There has never been a law that forced black people to give up their independent communities. We did that willingly. Dr. King cannot be blamed for it because he was already dead. Integration did not take full swing until the early 70s. And in many respects, it still hasn't taken full swing. Most black kids go to 87% segregated schools. Most black people still live in 87% segregated residential areas. Okay? Capital and wealth is almost exclusively still dominated by non-Africans. We own less than 1% of America's wealth. So even to this day, there hasn't been any true integration. So there definitely wasn't none by 1970 after King being murdered in 68. So for me, I think black people often use Dr. King as a scapegoat for their own love and addiction to white folks. Okay. We did not have to send our kids into those schools. We wanted to send them into those schools. We did not have to give up our independent businesses and hospitals. We chose to. All the black banks we used to have back then, we chose to give them up. Now, mind you, you had places like Rosewood in Charleston and Wilmington, okay, in places like Tulsa that were destroyed by overt white power with the help of the United States government. But even in those cases, many times, those brothers and sisters returned to those communities to rebuild them. And it was their children and grandchildren who did not believe in black independence. It was their children and grandchildren who thirsted for white acceptance. It was their children and grandchildren who wanted to be a part of the illusion of inclusion, who voluntarily gave up independent black communities so they could have an opportunity to be pat on the head by white folks. So Dr. King is not to be blamed. No one man can do that. Besides, he was already dead before the full effects of so-called integration took place. We did that. See, when people say, segregation was better when people say we need to go back to segregation 
The only issue I have with that, we did do better when we were segregated. But the question is, why did we do better when we were segregated? The reason we did better when we were segregated is because the white folk did not allow us to participate in the political and economic reality of these United States. You were not allowed. You were not given any access. So you had no choice but to work with each other. And for anyone to say, that Donald Trump needs to put us back in segregation in order for us to work together, that's a goddamn shame. For your enemy to have to force you to work with each other, you need your enemy to put you back in segregation so you can do what is right for yourself, that is a goddamn shame. Nobody's enemy should have to make them do what is right for them. And so when people say they should have left us in segregation, what we are saying is we need white folks. We need white folks to put in place structure, discipline, order, and segregation to force black people to work with other black people. If your enemy has any role in your freedom, if your enemy has any role in your liberty, if it is your enemy that is necessary to deliver you from yourself, then you still a goddamn slave. You still a slave. So to answer your question, my good brother, Dr. King played no role. Integration didn't come until after Dr. King was gone. I still say that's the illusion of inclusion. And I think that he had a lot to do with that. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Do a, but do we can agree to disagree on that. I appreciate your answer on that, uh, Dr. Umar. It was a very enlightening answer. Uh, one question that I do have, I have a 14-year-old son, um, okay. and one question I wanted to ask is, how do I separate, I, I tell him that this rap music and these rap videos and everything that he sees all the time is all strictly entertainment, just like a movie, but it's hard for me to get through to him that it's just like a movie when he sees certain things happening in his community with other black men who drive these fancy cars, who wear these fancy shoes, who have these types of necklaces. But what I try to tell him is it's all entertainment. So he's like, well, why does this guy have it? He's not an entertainer. So I'm, I'm trying to, to get him to understand that all this stuff that he sees on TV with these rappers and popping bottles and doing all this stuff, it's all about entertainment. But I, I can't drive that point home to him. And uh, that's my question. Of, uh, where, 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 where do y'all live at? Where do y'all live at, my brother? What we city? Live in Lexington, Kentucky. That's right. I'm sorry. You told me that already. Okay. Well, he's 14. You might want to consider two-part answer. Number one, you might want to consider sitting him on my unapologetically African Black College and Consciousness Tour that we'll be hosting out of Atlanta this year, January 28th to july the 12 14 days and 14 nights with the prince of pan-africanism so we're going to hit up a lot of the colleges in the south and a lot of significant uh black uh landmarks as it relates to our history and struggle I i'll definitely be able to drive the point home but on top of that it might be time to get him a good book on wealth uh so he can understand the truth about hip-hop and there's even been some books written about hip-hop in particular that talks about the wealth gap within hip-hop and how and, and how hip hop is actually akin to sharecropping. Now, in the sports world, I would have you have them read Forty Million Dollar Slaves, you know. But we're dealing with entertainment, and there's a couple titles out there, but none of them are coming to my head right now. But I would get him a good book on the true background of hip hop, and a lot of rappers have written about hip hop too. So it might be time to get him some of those books that was written by some of the rappers who really did not end on their feet the way that they thought that they would. But I think also that it would be a good idea to have a conversation with him about values. Now is the time to impress upon him values. We don't value money. We don't. It's about values. He may like it, but it's important that he don't value it. And the problem with black youth is they're not just uh, uh, they're not just attracted to the cars. They're not just attracted to the Air Jordans. They value them. They put a priority on that stuff. They need it in order to feel important. They need it in order to validate their lives. That's when it becomes a problem. I don't have a problem with my child liking video games, but I have a problem with him being so addicted 
to the video game that the video game is necessary and essential in order for him to function. That's a problem. You like the Air Jordan sneaker? No problem. Okay? But I don't want you to be so uh, 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 enamored with Air Jordan, so addicted to the brand that you need it in order to feel sufficient. Because once you come to that level, now white corporate capitalism is dictating your self-esteem. And we cannot have that. Before I go to the next question, let me deal with something real quick here. Uh, give me two minutes for my callers. I want to deal with this uh, Terrence Bailey, Frederick Douglass bullshit that I've been going through. Uh, some of you guys are aware that uh, one of my trolls is Terrence Bailey who apparently seems to be some sort of distant cousin of mine. I don't claim his ass, though. Okay, I don't claim him at all. But um, I just want to say that Terrence Bailey has been claiming that Dr. Umar Johnson is not a relative of Frederick Douglass. Well, how did Terrence Bailey get my phone number? You want to know how Terrence Bailey got my phone number? Because he called one of the members of the Bailey Casson family uh, executive committee, for lack of a better word. And she sent me an inbox saying that we have a cousin uh, who wants to talk to you uh, by the name of Terrence Bailey. She sent me an inbox on Facebook, okay? Relatives, okay? Because I don't call them family. I'm going to call them relatives. Family is family. These are just relatives, okay? Um, and so I called him up and we spoke on the phone. Uh, this was a couple months ago. And he was calling me for Ken Norris, uh, someone else who claims to be a direct descendant of Frederick Douglass. Now, for the record, those of you who know me, you know that I have never claimed to be a direct descendant of Frederick Douglass. I have never claimed that. I am a direct descendant of Frederick Douglass's first cousin and half brother by the name of Stephen Henry Bailey, my four times great grandfather, who happens to be the same Stephen that Frederick talks about in his autobiographies. When Frederick Douglass talks about growing up with cousin Stephen, that's my four times great grandfather. Terrence Bailey knows this shit because my name is on the Bailey family tree. How did my name get on the tree? Why was I allowed to go to family reunions? Why do I get a letter every other year inviting me to family reunions? Okay? So that whole, hold on, that whole Terrence Bailey thing is just a bunch of hate shit. It's a bunch of hate shit. Okay? And I think it's coming from the fact that when people think of Frederick Douglass, they don't think of him. When people think of Frederick Douglass, they don't think of Ken Morris. When people think of Frederick Douglass, they don't think of all the tens of thousands of descendants of Isaac and Betsy Bailey. They think of me. They think of me. So there's jealousy within my relatives, okay, that is bringing this forth of hatred forward that Terrence Bailey had. I don't know this Negro. I never met him. I never met him. So I'm sure he's a distant relative because his last name is Bailey. Bailey is the family name. I want y'all to understand something. None of us have no exclusive uh, uh, relationship to Frederick Douglass. There's thousands of us. Isaac and Betsy Bailey had over a dozen children. You understand? I come through one of their children named Betsy. Frederick comes through one of their children named Harriet. And then they had other children. I'm not a direct descendant of Frederick Douglass. But I'm a direct descendant of his cousin and half-brother who he grew up with. Okay, I'm not a relative of Frederick Douglass by marriage. I'm a relative of Frederick Douglass by blood, by blood. You understand? The blood that ran in Frederick Douglass veins runs in my veins. Bailey family, certified Bailey family. Okay, so that Terrence Bailey shit, I'm going to leave that alone. I just wanted to clarify that because I know some of y'all needed me to answer that. Okay, so the next time he start his shit, just ask him a real simple question. Real simple. Is Umar Johnson and Frederick Douglass both descendants of Isaac and Betsy Bailey? That's it. No more conversation. Is Umar Johnson and Frederick Douglass, are they both descendants of Isaac and Betsy Bailey? That's it. That's the only question you need for his bitch ass. Excuse my French. Let's go back to the call. Do we have another question on the line? I want to show you guys something. Uh, appreciate that. Before I take the next call, this right here 
is uh, one of the books of our family. If you see that genealogy and history of Stephen, Bailey, descendant of Isaac. Okay, and, and, and Betsy, y'all see that? Okay, and then here's my four times great grandfather, Stephen. This is my four times, this is the man that Frederick Douglass grew up with, the cousin Stephen that he talks about. Okay, that's my four times great grandfather. You know, I shouldn't have to go through this. My four times great grandmother, Caroline Wilson Belly. They was both born into slavery. Grandpa, grandma, you understand? I don't like playing these sucker games. Okay, and then Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass on their 50th wedding anniversary, on their 50th wedding anniversary, he gave them a Bible. Frederick Douglass on their 50th wedding anniversary gave his cousin and half brother a Bible with the names of all their children in it. Okay, this was in the Bible that Frederick Douglass gave them on their 50th wedding anniversary. And as you can see, the first uh, child is uh, where we at? Okay, George Washington Bailey. Okay, here we go. George Washington Bailey. That's my three times great grandfather, first black public school teacher in Talbot County, Maryland. Okay. 1841, he was born. Okay. 1841, I got my family tree on the wall right there. I don't like going through it. One more thing while we at it, before I go to the next call. I don't have a doctorate degree, right? I don't have a doctorate degree, right? Right? This right here is my doctoral dissertation, okay? Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. You see that, right? Umar Johnson, Side D, Doctor of Psychology. You see the date, right? What that say? June of 2012, right? I ain't got no doctorate, right? Here we go right here. Okay, hold on. The signature page, right? It ain't official unless you got the signatures, right? It ain't official unless you got the signatures. You understand? So, that's all. You know, not related to Frederick Douglass. Ain't got no doctorate. You know, this this the stuff y'all want to play with me. So, I just decided to show some proof. For those of y'all on the telephone, I'm showing proof on Facebook Live that I have my doctorate and that I am related to Frederick Douglass because those seem to be the two most recurring conflicts that keep coming up as it relates to my credibility. And the third thing is what am I doing with the school money? Which is the dumbest question I ever heard. What I'm doing with the school money is I'm saving it to buy a damn school. That's what I'm doing with the school money. Uh, we looked at a school yesterday. I was at a school yesterday here in Pennsylvania, $1.4 million. I loved it. They got a residential, they got a dorm, they got a gym. It was a nice little, only thing I don't like about it, it's in a white neighborhood. That's the only thing I don't like about it. But it's a former Catholic school. Yeah. Not bad, but I still got some other schools to look at. We will have a school in 2017. So we didn't dealt with Frederick Douglass. We didn't dealt with the doctorate. Once I get to school, I want to know what they're going to say then. Because y'all just about shut down. Y'all been shut down. Hate has been shut down. So I, 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 I don't know what we're going to do. You know what I mean? What, what, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? We, 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 we running out of stuff. I told I, listen. I told y'all when I went to Africa 2005, Africa 2005, ancestors they 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 sent me back ready for this. They sent me back ready for this. So whatever they throw at me, we're gonna throw at me. But let's go back to the questions. Uh, do we have another question about the children on the line right now? Okay. Um, he's five. He has to, we have to eliminate him from putting his hands on other children. Play fighting is not acceptable anymore. In my opinion, play fighting, when I grew up, we used to play fight, but we didn't have the type of black on black violence we got right now. It was there. But see, this is on steroids. See, back when I was growing up, you know, the, the 80s, the crack had just hit. And see, when that crack came in, because we already had gangs. We had gangs. We had the street culture. But back then, when there was a gang war, you came to the gang war with brass knuckles. You came to the gang war with a bat. You came to the gang war with a chain. 
You came to the gang war with a pipe. You came to the gang war with a brick. Okay, so I'm from North Philadelphia. So my parents' generation, you know, we had the gangs. You know, West Philly had the gangs and North Philly had the gangs. We had the Moon Gang, North Street, Diamond Street Gang. They had gangs and people got killed occasionally. That's correct. But it was through, I want to say, uh, 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 through manual means. Okay, maybe one person had a gun. There only was one person in the gang, or maybe two, who actually had a gun. Everybody else has silent weapons. But when the crack came in, that's when the American, the National Rifle Association and the gun producing industry began to target inner cities in order to offload a lot of the excess weapons that they did not sell during the year. And so with the drug culture came the gun culture. Prior to crack, you did not have everybody in the gang with a gun. Now everybody got a gun in a gang or not. That was not the case in the 60s and 70s. You may have had one or two people in the gang that had a gun. Now everybody got a gun. So I'm saying all that to say that play fighting is over. One out of every four black men will be murdered in his lifetime by his 35th birthday by another black male. There could be no more play fighting. That's over. So what you have to do is you got to go through the principles of behavioral modification, rewards and consequences. When he play fights, what is the consequence at home? Remember, behavior don't change until you change it. And he will not be motivated to change his behavior until you give him an offer he cannot refuse. That's what behavioral change is all about. It's about giving our children offers that they cannot refuse. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. And it got to be something that he, he don't want no part of. So the consequences have to be effective. Now, because he's so young, the basic consequence you have to use, as well as the basic reward for a five-year-old is attention. For a five-year-old, attention is more important than breathing. For a five-year-old, his mommy's attention is more important than eating. For a five-year-old, his mommy's attention is more important than sleep. Okay, you're more important to him than breathing, eating, or sleeping. So when he messes up, he gets deprived of your attention. That means what? You come home after school, you're going to do your homework, I'm going to check it, we're going to have a nice little 10-minute conversation, we're going to eat dinner, and you're going to bed early. I don't care if the, if the sun's still up. You will be in that bed as soon as you're done your homework and as soon as you're done eating. If that means five o'clock bed, so be it. What you have to do yeah. is you have to crush him with boredom. Kill him with boredom. The worst thing you can do to a five-year-old boy is bore him to death. Take his toys, TV, video game, take everything out that room. It'll be a bare room, nothing in it he can use to play with. You have to make sure there's nothing in there. He can play with absolutely nothing. And that's how you get him. After a couple of days of that, he'll come back crying to you. Mommy, I promise you, I won't do it no more. And then on the flip side, you got to have rewards that he can well, work I'm, towards. I'm glad to hear you say that because I've definitely done that this weekend. And he came home yesterday like, I didn't put my hands on anybody. So thank you. I, I guess I'm just really concerned about what's being built in school. Like at home, I, I understand he got to he got his hands to himself, point blank. Um, and we go over the principles of my eye, and then I also spoke to the stepbrother so he could get that from a man too. Um, so yes, I'm glad that I'm on the right path. Do I not need to be concerned about what's being documented or how it's being documented in school? Well, what you need to do for that, uh, I would wait till the end of the school year. Or you don't. Well, he's in kindergarten, so he's not going to have much in his file. But you can request a copy of his complete academic record, which is your right under the federal FERPA law, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act of 1974. And you just put your request in writing to the principal. I'm the parent of this young man. I would like a complete copy of my child's educational record to include standardized testing, discipline, um, classroom information, and anything else. And you can look at it and if there's anything in it that you think unfairly reflects upon your son, you can challenge that information to be removed from the file. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the, the last note asked if I wanted to set up a, an appointment with a counselor. 
And I guess that's when my red flags went up. Do I not need to be concerned about They want you to set up a meeting with the counselor for what? To talk about what? To figure out how we, meaning his teacher, the counselor, and myself, can help address the problem. I don't like the counselor being involved because that implies a mental health or emotional problem. <clears throat> uh, I'm not saying you have to request that she be excluded from the meeting, but I would ask for clarity on why she's there because this is an issue that can be dealt with with the parent, the teacher, and the principal. I don't see a need for the counselor. Now, in some schools, the counselors play that role. In some schools, the counselor might be involved in behavioral management or discipline strategy if that's the case so be it but in my opinion i don't think you should ever give the school permission for the counselor to meet with your son privately in my experience okay. having been doing this for almost 20 years working in schools for almost 20 years as both a school psychologist and a school principal okay and i'll be a school principal again once we buy one of these schools for fdmg I have, I have rarely seen a counselor who does not use that relationship with your child. I have rarely seen a counselor who does not use that relationship with your child as an opportunity to investigate and infiltrate your personal family business. Instead of counseling, that will be an indoctrination on what's going on in your house. Instead of counseling your son, They'll be asking your son how many men they he's seen. Do you still live with your daddy? What's your mommy boyfriend name? Do he smoke weed? Do you have enough to eat? You know, uh, uh, are you happy there? You got to be very careful because your son is young and he loves his mommy to death. But guess what? White folks are very, very clever. White folks are very, very clever. And I don't know if this counselor is black or white, but you got to be careful because before you know it, you'll be getting a subpoena to go to court or you'll be getting investigated by Child Protective Services because they claim your son said that he didn't eat last night or they claim your son said that the house was too cold or they claim your son said that your boyfriend punched him in the face. I mean, I've seen some crazy things, some untrue crazy things come out of black parents letting white counselors meet with their child. Here's what you need to tell them. I will get my own counseling for my son on my own outside of school without your help. And then they're going to say, would you mind signing this release of information form so we can speak with your son's counselor? No, I will not sign that because you have no need to meet with my son's counselor without my notice. You have no need to talk to them without me being aware of it. If there's anything I feel, so you gotta let them know I'm the parent here. I run this. If there's anything that I feel you need to know, I will either tell you myself or I will have the counselor write a letter. But in, I don't see any need for you, or you can tell them, I'm not, I don't, I, not only do I not see a need, I'm not comfortable with you talking to my son's counselor behind my back. I wanna be involved in all communication. If you want a meeting with the counselor, we can set that up. So you let them know. <laughs> if you want a meeting, you can set that up. I didn't got a problem with you talking to the counselor, but you will have that conversation in my presence. Be very careful about that. Okay, be very careful about that. If they want counseling, get your own counseling. Get your own. And I can all and I could, you know, I could uh, give you the info for the Association of Black Psychologists, but you can also look for a licensed black social worker, licensed black professional counselor marriage you know licensed family therapist you know but keep them out of your business as much as you can the school is not your friend the school is not your friend and i keep telling black parents this you know mothers sometimes they have a difficult time understanding that the school is not your friend and the reason so many black mothers have a problem understanding that the school is not their friend is because the school is ran by mothers these women are also mothers they have their own children but what we fail to realize is there's a double standard in everything. The way white people treat your kids and the way white people treat their kids is totally different. It's like when black parents say, well, you keep talking this black boy ADHD stuff, but there's a lot of white boys diagnosed with ADHD. That's correct. There's a lot of white boys diagnosed with ADHD. But here's the kicker. That white boy will be given privileges because of his ADHD. 
where your black boy will be given exclusions and disadvantages because of his ADHD. Two kids in the same class, ADHD, one white, one black. Because he has ADHD, that white boy might not get suspended. Because he has ADHD, that white boy will be allowed to get away with things. Because he has ADHD, that school is going to work with his parents to make sure he gets what he needs. That black boy, they're going to put him on Ritalin. They're going to put him on Concerta. They're going to put him on uh, Cycler. They're going to put him on Adderall. They're going to oversuspend him. They're going to have him in a disciplined school. They're going to put him in special ed for emotional disturbance. So black parents need to understand you cannot do what white folks do with these disorders in special ed. There's two different, just like there's two different Americas. There's a black America and there's a white America. Well, guess what? There's a black special ed and there's a white special ed. Very important that we understand this. Because we keep on saying, well, the white folks got away with it. You ain't white. Okay? You ain't white. And so it's very important that we understand that. But don't let them speak with the counselor. Get a copy of your record. And make sure you be consistent with your punishments and your rewards. And you'll be able to fix that whole situation. Thank you. No problem, Queen. Yes, we do need a better curriculum. But I want to be clear. Curriculum is only as good as the people implementing it. A curriculum is only as good as the people implement it. So, for example, with a lot of the Hotep homeschoolers, with the Hotep homeschool movement, they keep running around talking about they got an Afrocentric curriculum and they got this and they got this and all this stuff, which is which is all fine. OK, which is all fine. But I want to know who you got implementing that curriculum. OK, for example, you just bought a brand new set of drums. You bought a brand new set of drums. This is the best drum that they make. The best African drum that they make. Straight from the Congo. But guess what? If the person you got playing that drum don't know how to play that drum, then that drum will sound like it is nothing. That drum will sound like it's a bootleg drum instead of the best drum on earth. So it's not just the instrument. The curriculum is the instrument. But you need teachers who know how to play that instrument. And if you ain't got the right teachers to play that curriculum instrument, then the curriculum will ultimately be denigrated and the quality of it will ultimately be compromised because you don't have the right people to play it. That's why with the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, we have received over, uh, I got to double check, at least 500 resumes, at least 500. I think we almost up to a thousand. I got to double check. But that's how many resumes and people say, do you need all those resumes? You damn right, because I need the best people in front of your children. Let, let me tell you all something. One of the biggest problems I got with education, I don't care if it's public school, parochial school, charter school, independent school. One of the biggest problems I have with education is that principals and school districts often put the adults ahead of the children. Principals and school districts often put the adults ahead of the children. Okay, so what I'm saying then is at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, we will not put the adults ahead of children. So when people tell me, listen, I'm going to work at your school, I want you to work at my school too. But you're only going to work at my school if you're the best person for that position to be put in front of our children. I cannot promise anybody a position at FDMG because if I promise you a position at FDMG before I have uh, interviewed you and before you have demonstrated competency, then I'm putting you above the children. What if I hire somebody who I respect in the conscious community and then they get in the classroom and they ineffective? They're not committed to our children then I'm compromised. Then I become a hypocrite because I got somebody in the class who I know ain't good, but I'm going to leave them there because we have a personal relationship. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. If you are not the best person for that position that I can find or who has applied, you will not be there. And I know a lot of people are going to be mad at me. I know there's a lot of folks who believe in uh, patronage who believe that they should get a job by association. Nobody's getting a job at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy by association. I will hire an enemy who can be committed to our children before I hire a comrade who cannot. 
FDMG is about FDMG. It is not about you paying your bills. It is not about your status. It is not about you looking like a uh, conscious groupie or none of that. It's about the kids. If you're the best, you get the job. If you ain't, you ain't. My school would be like a football team. On a football team where you no longer catching touchdowns, you out of here. Football team, you miss too many field goals, you out of here. So every teacher at my school is going to be a free agent. Every teacher at my school is going to be a free agent because the minute that the quality of their work diminishes, they will be put on the free agent list and they ass will be released. Uh, do we have another question? Oh, go ahead, my brother. Uh, yes. Can I go ahead? Go ahead, my brother. Can I go? Yes, you can. Uh, yes, I think, yeah, yeah, but that be, uh, uh, Dr. Umar Johnson, uh, calling out South Carolina, I've got a little horse here, man, trying to got some scope symptoms. Would that be directly talking with you? Uh, uh, would that be when you said you were hiring an entity? And I understand that with it before you get the, uh, person from the conscious community and does not, and, and can't fulfill that position. Uh, would that be in the gays? When I say punk fatty, I'm going to be direct or lesbian. Based on that, they can be qualified, and I'm going to say them. I don't think they're qualified personality Why would you have them at that at that school, uh, doctor? Okay. Two answers. Even in an independent school, even in an independent school, it will be difficult yes, to discriminate against someone based on gender overtly, overtly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but. How do I say this? Because, you know, I got haters watching. Uh, you and I know what I have to do to make sure this school is what it needs to be. Do you, do you read between those lines, my brother? And I'm going to do my I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to do my due dil diligence to make sure I put the right people in front of our children who stand for what we stand for and who don't stand for what we stand for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Next question. Thank you, sir. No problem. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, I'm 20 years old and I recently just found out that I'm going to be a child and I had this child with a white woman. Yes. So I'm just wondering as a therapist, have you recognized any patterns? of low self-esteem that biracial children have specifically? Biracial children, and I've done therapy with enough. I've dated biracial women, yeah, very good sisters. Patterns of like low self-esteem or anything that I should be looking at. Right, for. yeah, hear me out. Um, I've done therapy with biracial children, a lot of them. I have biracial friends. I've dated biracial sisters in my past, uh, very good sisters. Um, and I can tell you that being biracial comes with a challenge because you're growing up essentially as a race in between. Uh, you're half African, you're half European. So you're half God and half devil at the same time. And so it can be very difficult to navigate those waters because on the one hand, you know, you know you're black, but when you look in the mirror, you don't quite feel it, even though that is what you are biologically and anthropologically, you're an African. On the other hand, yeah. you know you're not white, but you're related to white people. And even in your family, you can clearly see that you're being treated differently because you know that your father is black. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to raise that child with unshakable, unquestionable self-esteem. That means you're going to have to talk honestly and openly about race. That means you're going to have to have conversations with family. You're going to have to let both sides. You're going to have to let the black side know that I don't want to hear no biracial jokes. I don't want to hear no light skin jokes. None of that stuff. You're going to have to talk to the white family and tell them that if I ever, ever, ever hear of you making a racist joke about black folks around my child, you will never see my child again. You're going to have to be firm because if it's one thing that I've heard from nearly every biracial child or adult I've ever met in my life is most of them have had to deal with traumatization by way of verbal abuse regarding their African ancestry from their white relatives. I have heard that from nearly every biracial person. I know one sister I dated, she was biracial in the Garvey movement with me. And she used to tell me about how they would make little uh, N-word jokes about their hair. 
you know, N-word jokes about the black butt and stuff like that. You know, so you got to you going to have to lay that law down. But the most important thing you can do is let that child know that they African. Give them that identity. Let them know this is what you are and let everybody in their life know this is what they are. But your biggest challenge is not going to be from the family members or society. Your biggest challenge is going to be convincing his mother, convincing his mother that this child is black. It is the white mothers. It's the white mothers who often confuse the so-called biracial children about who they really are. So you're going to have to make sure you and her are clear. If the two of you are clear that this child is going to be raised unapologetically African, still respecting the white family, still admitting the white family, still having a relationship. He's not rejecting the white family. He just happens to be an African with a white family. That's it. But if you and the mom are on the same page, if you're on the same page, the child will be fine. But if she's in denial about her son being black, that's going to make it a little bit more difficult for you, but you can still get the job done. All right, Doc, I appreciate it. And then, when he, and then, when he, and then once I get the school open, send him to the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. I promise you after two weeks, he's going to know he all African. Yeah, I'm just wondering, when is the female school going to be up and running? Oh, it's a female? I'm sorry, you have a daughter. You have a daughter, not a son, yeah, correct? Right. Okay, my apologies. Um, I have two daughters myself. Uh, I don't know. As I said in the uh, previous comment, I'm looking at schools right now. And uh, it looks like, depending on the size of the school, we might be able to do boys and girls together. Depending on the size of the school, we, we might be able to do boys and girls together. But we only plan with about $700,000 right now. So I really think that the first school is going to be boys only. Some people think it should be anyway. But of course, with two daughters, okay, and six sisters... Okay, and a million aunts and a million female cousins and nieces, you know, I'm very yeah. sensitive to the needs of females. So I would like to do, you know, boys and girls if I can. But I think we're going to end up with a small to medium sized school, which will only allow us to start off with the boys at first. But we will be extending to the Anna Douglas Amy Garvey Academy as soon as we can. 